All right, uh, so today we're going to finish off application security, uh, and we're going to talk about this thing called source component analysis. Uh, so if you recall, we're looking at application security, and we talked about DevSecOps, and we're like, all these things that could be done in the application security domain, but we're going to focus on these two things. Uh, language selection is what we did last week. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about source component analysis. And this, I would say, is a growing area uh, in application security. This is something that people are grappling with, especially over the last, I would say, five years. Uh, this is becoming a really important aspect. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is using vulnerable components. And the idea here is that if you know you have a vulnerable component in your, in your uh, application, you need to update that as soon as you can. So that's the idea. And the reason why this is really important is if you look at the amount of custom code that we write for an application, the amount that we can write is typically fixed, right? Like you have a team of developers, maybe you're writing, you know, 10 lines of code an hour, like productively. Uh, so the amount of code that you can actually produce is has stayed the same. We're all humans, we're all generating, well, I mean, this is before Copilot or any of that other uh, stuff. Uh, but what has has uh, grown in the last, I would say, 10 and 20 years is the amount of libraries that we're using to build our applications on top of. And this is growing at a staggering rate. And this is a conservative estimate, but they're saying like about 20% of your application is custom, but then underneath the iceberg is what you what you don't see is like 80% of this code is someone else's. And it's usually code that you don't know the person who developed uh, has written. And you don't know whether or not they're using secure coding practices. Uh, you don't know what their intentions are. You're just using the code because, hey, it, it's providing me something that I, that I need. Um, and so the reason why this is growing is if you look at modern programming languages, like Python and JavaScript and Go. Uh, the reason why people love these modern languages is because of these rich package repositories that come with using them. You can develop a whole bunch of cool stuff without having to write a whole bunch of uh, code yourself. And so this is one of my favorite cartoons where this person's like, oh, all I have to do is import anti-gravity and there I can fly. And that's basically the feeling when you're writing Python code and you're like, oh, I have this package. I don't have to implement any of this. Like for me, it was like beautiful soup. Beautiful soup is this HTML parser. And I'm like, gosh, I like can parse an HTML DOM and not have to actually write a parser myself. That's like anti-gravity for, uh, for a lot of people. Okay, but the problem is, is that you don't know whether or not there are vulnerabilities in those components that you're using. And now uh, the ubiquitous problem that applications are facing is what happens when someone finds a vulnerability in the code that you're using and how do you remediate that thing? And this can happen anywhere where you're using vulnerable components. I just mentioned package repositories and languages. But when you think about Ubuntu or Linux or the Kali VM, you're like importing a whole bunch of other kinds of packages and you don't real you don't really understand where their per or what their security posture is in any of those packages. But you're relying on that. That's actually in your infrastructure. And this is this is a problem. It can occur anywhere. Operating system, network, web framework, web application, database backend. All of these components that we're using right now to build our applications on top of. And so virtually every application has these vulnerable components and you need teams to just be focusing on making sure everything that they rely upon is up to date. And this is a difficult task for most people to keep track of. And not only that, you have to, you have to do a pretty good inventory of the components and where they're located. And and so if you're using virtual machines, if you're using containers, and if you think about what developers are using, they're just pulling stuff left and right. And like, who's keeping track of the security posture of the stuff they use? Typically developers will say, hey, I'm gonna use this. I got it to work, that's it. As long as it works, I'm good. I can go to the next thing. Uh, and that's that's the real uh, tension here. And so, 
uh, it turns out that the developers that are using these components, they often don't know where they all are after they uh, used them, and they don't know what if, whether or not any of them need an update uh, in terms of a security update. Uh, and and there's no there's no process in place in many places to keep track of this. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we that the industry has done um, to to get to try and get their heads around this problem is to develop these two uh, uh, frameworks. And there are the CVE and the CVSS frameworks because we have to be able to talk about vulnerabilities and their severity. So CVE, uh, and this came out of this paper um, that I've linked here. CVE is, stands for the Common Vulnerability and Exposures Framework. And this allows us to label the vulnerability, the specific vulnerability that a piece of software might have. And that allows us to, you know, it, we'll give it a unique number, a CVE with a number and say, hey, for this particular software, it's got this particular vulnerability and I've identified it. So we can then exchange information about that specific vulnerability. So we needed a nomenclature. And then we needed some kind of way of identifying the severity of each one of these CVEs. And that's what this vulnerability scoring system is. And it's a scale from one to 10. And 10 means you better go out there and patch this right now. Otherwise, your whole enterprise is going to get owned. And then one is like, eh, you know, the severity, maybe, maybe you can put that in the back burner. And so these are the things that you'll come across when you're looking at your software supply chain and then saying, well, what do I address? Because basically, when you look at the software that an enterprise is running, you got thousands of CVEs in your infrastructure. And you're like, well, which one do I address first? And this is where the score matters. So you can prioritize this. Because almost as soon as you deploy your software, where it becomes out of date, like because uh, of new uh, new patches and vulnerabilities that were identified. So let me talk about the severity of this problem and what can go wrong and what are the issues, uh, because it's not a simple thing to address. You might think that this is a simple problem to solve, but it's not. So here's an example. This is called Image Tragic, and so Image Magic is an open sourced. Uh, set of tools that does transcoding of images from one format to another. This is built into a whole bunch of image processing uh, like, uh, applications. So for example, like in Google Photos, when you're trying to transcode an image or generate a thumbnail, uh, you're trying to go from a PNG to a GIF to a JPEG. Uh, a lot of people are like, they're not writing their own code for this. They're leveraging image magic. Uh, and image magic is sometimes statically compiled into an application. That means you actually take the library code and ship it as part of your application code. Uh, now, this is a problem because in 2016, they found a bug in image magic that allowed remote code execution. Now, here's the problem with this is that in order to fix this bug, you have to recompile your application. And so this is a bug that they're like, you know what? This is probably going to be the, the long tail of image tragic is going to be you know, going to be huge because uh, you're going to you have to rely on everywhere that this is being used that there's a developer that can recompile the code and then ship an update. Uh, so that's an issue. Here's another interesting case. This is Auth0. It's an authentication company, and uh, there was a vulnerability in 2019 that was discovered where there was some debug code. That was left in their in in the library that they were using, and this debug code said, "Hey, you know the signature that you sent me? Uh, that isn't quite what it, the correct sig signature is. This is what I was expecting." <laughs> and so the 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 code itself is revealing the answers to to the signature check that uh, is being used, and so this is bad. Uh, but, you know, debug code is in just about anything anyone writes, like you want to actually figure out what your application does and what goes wrong. Uh, what's really interesting about this one is that when they did the postmortem, how did this get in there and how did this stay in there? And this is where uh, this is why I'm using this particular example. This vulnerability was in the code base of a package that Auth0 was using. And this was in a package 
that was introduced in 2011. And the company was founded in 2013. And so as part of starting this company up, they used vulnerable components, right? And they didn't know they had this vulnerable code in their, their system. And so here, uh, six years later, uh, this is where the CVE uh, basically wrecked them. Um, and so that's, that's an interesting case where uh, you can get, and this is their authentication. I mean, that's all they do, right? Authentication. And to have this be the vulnerability that, that uh, is in their system is pretty bad. Um, and so this is this is something where they forked a library and then they forgot that they had this dependency. Uh, and then because they forked it, they 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 weren't tracking the the library as it was being updated uh, after the fact. OK. Uh, here's another example from 2017. So Equifax is one of the more prominent breaches uh, that we've talked about in this class, at least. And so this basically exposed a whole bunch of uh, credit information of a bunch of customers from Equifax. So this was a result of this Apache struts vulnerability. And 14 months after Equifax got owned, they did a survey and they were looking at everyone who was still downloading the vulnerable version of Apache struts. And they saw basically 10,000 companies still using vulnerable versions of Apache. Uh, Apache struts. And this particular vulnerability, one of the things with Apache struts is that the library that had the vulnerability, you need to recompile it with Java in order to get the update that prevents the vulnerability. But most web applications that are using Apache struts, uh, they don't have the developers in place still to rebuild the web application in order to get that fix. And this is why a bunch of companies still had this in their infrastructure 14 months later. Uh, so this is the severity of a pro uh, uh, of of using something like Java for your runtime uh, web application. Here's another one that's really prominent. People are using containers uh, like crazy. So containers are basically virtual operating systems. And so this is a way of bootstrapping an operating system install that has a whole bunch of the software that you need pre-installed in the container so you don't have to do it yourself. So people are pulling these images from places like Docker Hub. And uh, if you look at the top 10 most popular Docker images on Docker Hub, and this was done uh, in 2019, uh, they, they all have vulnerabilities in them. And so even though you're pulling a blessed version of a container image, it could go out of date. And then you, will, then you, have, a, you have exposure to vulnerabilities in these containers that you're using uh, in your infrastructure. Um, and so the statistic is uh, the people who are maintaining, they did a survey, so as part of this report, they did a survey of the people maintaining these things, and then 70% of them really lack the skills to be able to understand and keep these things up to date with the security uh, uh, problems that, that arise. Okay, so that is just a sampling of the problem that we have in keeping our software up to date and just maintaining infrastructure to patch this. This is one of the things that if you if you go into into industry and you get a security job, one of the one of the most common jobs that you might get is to manage the patching infrastructure, manage the updates, uh, making sure that your entire enterprise is kept up to up to date as as much as possible. Okay, some prevention, uh, and these are kind of buzzwords uh, that have been, well, they're more than buzzwords. These are actual uh, things that are being done, uh, and one of the, the more recent developments is the idea of doing a software bill of materials just to get an inventory. We need to be able to, in the enterprise, do an audit of everything that we're running and an inventory. And then because, you know, we have these databases of CVEs and CVSSs that are associated with these CVEs. Now all we need to do is figure out everything that we're running, all of the packages that they depend upon, and then to line that up with the CVE and the CVSSs that are out there. And that helps you get your mind around what, what, am, what are my exposures in my enterprise. And so software bill of materials helps you do this. And so the idea, and this is taken from a bill of materials 
uh, that's analogous to physical products. So here, this is a, a bill of materials for making something. I forget what it's some a boat, I, I would imagine. Uh, a, a pump, a pump for a boat. And so this is a typical bill of materials that would allow you to identify all the pieces that you need in your supply chain in order to build this particular artifact. And so the idea of a software bill of materials is to do the equivalent for your software. Uh, so this is an example, uh, or this is a figure of what uh, an SBOM is. And so there is a software package data exchange standard SPDX. Uh, this is an open standard for all of the software uh, maintainers to identify what their dependencies are, what code have they imported, what version. Uh, and then if I can create a single document that labels everything that I'm shipping to you as a customer, then I can do something similar to what the physical bill of materials is. So this is an example. You have you know, open source dependencies, some of the code that you've written and the versioning of the code that you that you can identify, binaries and firmware that you're using, and then libraries that you're using. And then this is basically uh, encoded in your in your document uh, in this SPDX format. And then that allows you to uh, for your customer who's who's receiving your software to figure out what 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 are my exposures by me purchasing your software and running it in my enterprise uh, is the idea. OK, uh, another thing that you can do is vulnerability scanning. There are a lot of automated tools, uh, and some of these are called security compliance automation uh, tools, where they basically tap into the database of CVEs. And with each CVE, there is a a way there's what they call an indicator of compromise or an indicator of vulnerability where they can test whether or not you're vulnerable if your version is vulnerable to that CVE. And so as that backend database, there are automated tools that can check all the CVEs against all of the things that you're running in the enterprise. And that's what vulnerability scanning is. Uh, so Nessus Cloud is an example, Security Monkey for AWS. There's a lot of tooling out there for you to just get a lay of the land of the components that you're running and whether or not they have CVEs uh, in them. So there's some, uh, uh, this is an example. And so here is an example that combines the SBOM with the vulnerability scanning for a specific Java application. And so you point your, your automated tools at your application and then it can identify things like, oh, these are, whoops, these are the different uh, security issues that I have. Um, these are the licenses. So, in terms of a component analysis, these are um, these are different. Um, I mean, it's more than just security issues for the SBOM. It's you know what licenses do I depend on in terms of being able to redistribute uh, this software. So, this is an example of that. Um, and then, what you would do? Uh, let's see, get my cursor back. Whoops. I am a second having some technical difficulties by clicking on that. Um, this tool will also uh, go through all the different components and they'll give you things like if in this column, you see the age of every one of your components. Like how long has have these components been around? Uh, how popular are they? Like, are they, see, uh, are they getting a lot of downloads? Are there a lot of eyes uh, uh, watching this particular package? What is the release history? How how long has it been since an up to date version has been released? And so, if this if the release history is such that you're you know the age of this package is super old, maybe you want to you know figure out whether or not you need to update that thing or find a, an alternative. And then this is the important one: these are the CVEs sorted by threat level. And so I mentioned one through ten. And so if this is your your CVSS score then you can say, oh, well, these are the component, these are the CVEs that I need to really address uh, in my application and then, and then act on that. So these are common automating, automated tools that allow you to get compliance checking and get software patching done on the things that really matter um, in, your, in your stack. Okay, um, another thing you can do is uh, if you have a source code base, you can point automated tooling at your code base directly in a continuous way. 
So, you know, the previous one is more like, oh, if I've imported, if I'm using someone else's code, um, I can do this. But in, in this case, uh, there are tools that allow you to write uh, as you do commits into your code base via Git, it will check to make sure uh, you're, you're not using a vulnerable package or a vulnerable component. And so uh, GitHub was one of the, uh, the, the GitHub service that got launched in November of 2017. This is one of the first examples of this, where what they were doing is they, they were looking at all the repositories that they were hosting, and they were basically enabling code to scan all of these repositories to find vulnerable packages being used in them. And so when they turned this on in November 2017, they discovered 4 million vulnerabilities in a half a million different repositories. And then as a result of doing this scan and notifying the repository owners, they basically got uh, almost a, a half a million patches uh, delivered by December. So this actually had a measurable change in the security posture of a whole bunch of people's uh, code, the ability to do this. And so this was so successful that this is now part of GitHub advanced security for, for you developers out there where they do this for free. Well, they, they have a free version that will analyze your code if you turn it on saying, hey, let me know. Let me know when I introduce some vulnerability in my supply chain via importing a package. Uh, what it'll also do is it'll scan your source code for any passwords and private keys in your repository. <laughs> so when, like, if you commit your AWS secret key into the the repo, it's actually going to catch that before it allows that that push into your repository. Okay, uh, Google has decided to try and do this for any open source software uh, project that is in their supply chain. And basically, this is ba this is almost this covers almost everybody's supply chain because Google is using a lot of open source in their products. And so the idea that the uh, of of this open SSF is to basically scan all of the popular repositories of open source software code, and then to try and uh, just continuously uh, ass assess vulnerabilities and remediate them if they're discovered. Uh, and this allows them to then, when they distribute the software inside of their internal tooling, it allows them to make sure that those are, those are I guess, hardened against vulnerability. Okay, um, here's another example uh, that's not GitHub. So Sneak is, an, is, is another company that will, if you give it your repository, it'll scan all the different repositories. Uh, it will find known vulnerabilities, and moreover, it'll issue pull requests for you to fix them. And so this is a picture of uh, the sneak interface. It's pointed to my repositories. And so in my 14 active projects, I have two high priority vulnerabilities um, that I should probably, well, so the reason why I have two high priority ones is because it's intentionally vulnerable, because I'm doing security. <laughs> security. I think this is because of... Uh, I have some project in there that's got an intentionally vulnerable package included. And so they, so it's good. Sneak identified it, but this is intentional. So, so that's, um, but it, then it would issue the, so this is so serverless, this is an example. So serverless goat is an intentionally vulnerable AWS app that I, that, so I'll be running this next, next quarter. And so I have this in my repository and they're like, oh yeah, hey, uh, you've got a, you got a vulnerability in there. Uh, and so that's that's one of the things. And basically, you can, if Sneak has identified a fix, you can open up a pull request to actually patch your repository to make it up to date. But if I if I if I did this though, then my exercise would fail next next uh, next quarter. Um, here's another one. It's called Dependabot, uh, and it's very similar to Sneak. So these are just you know, like these different uh, tools are, they're very similar to each other. I just wanted to give you a lay of the land. Uh, so Dependabot, you can run Dependabot as a container and then point it at a repository. And so uh, on a schedule, you, either on a schedule or you could run it as a GitHub action. Every time there's a commit, you could trigger uh, the Dependabot uh, software to scan your repository for any issues. And then if there are any issues, you can have this Dependabot 
uh, container, issue a pull request. And then this would go to a developer who would then see it and then decide to review and merge it. So again, this is part of your DevSecOps workflow now where you're checking uh, these things using automated tools. And this is really important because it's really hard for a developer uh, to go through and manually try and do this kind of exercise. So this is where automation is really key to address this particular problem. Um, another thing you can do is do uh, implement automatic software updates. Uh, so uh, if you have vulnerable components, you need a way to quickly update that vulnerability when it's been um, sort of identified. Uh, and this is an example I put here of what not to do. And so there are, uh, so we have a whole bunch of cases where we have these Internet of Things devices, so like web cameras, CCTV, CCTV cameras. And the problem with these devices is that uh, they haven't been built with automated update in mind. And so here's an example where there was a flaw in this GSOAP uh, sort of implementation. And this was basically a web object. This is a web object framework before we had JSON, before we had REST APIs and JSON, we had GSOAP or we had SOAP. And so these old school devices were using SOAP. And it turns out there's a remote code execution bug in a library that a whole bunch of these devices imported to build their, their, their web UI. Uh, and so this thing had a million downloads and it was baked into a bunch of products. And a lot of people don't even know they use it because if you're manufacturing a camera uh, and you, you did this before you started doing the bill of materials, you don't know the actual components inside of your software that you're shipping on your device. Uh, and so these, the code and the vulnerability they found were, it, it was cloned from repository to repository, from product version to product version, and they couldn't keep track of where it was. And so you have this in these web cameras uh, everywhere. And so this is, uh, this is someone who got interviewed, who, who's, who uh, from the company that discovered all of this. Uh, and so basically they saw that some of these web cameras were using versions of Linux that were basically 14 years old. If, we talk, if you remember the last class when we talked about all of these operating system like address space layout randomization and stack canaries, all of these things that have been developed to prevent security vulner, uh, vulnerabilities from happening, all of this stuff happened after uh, the version of Linux that is now being baked into these devices, right? Now, the big problem is that this is all in firmware now, and there's no firmware update mechanism in any of these cameras. So they're running a 14-year-old version of Linux that, do, that has no security mitigations, and they have no ability to update this software. And so the remediation that this person recommends is to just toss it in the trash. That's basically the only way you can make your network secure. Because if these, these cameras are on your network, the, it's basically a stepping stone for adversaries uh, to attack your, your infrastructure. OK, so what software vendors are now doing is forcible updates. And so WordPress is one of these applications that is notorious for having vulnerabilities in them. And they finally decided to uh, uh, allow their software to forcibly update old versions. And so they're not relying on people, on administrators updating their own version of WordPress anymore. They're saying, hey, if you want to use WordPress, you have to accept that we're going to push out updates and change the version of the software underneath you. And you'll see a lot of security vendors or a lot of software vendors are doing this. They're forcing updates and forcing you to like, so for example, Chrome um, can be set up to automatically update itself uh, without your knowledge or without your explicit consent. And more and more often we're going to this model exactly because otherwise we can't rely on the user to do the patching uh, themselves. Um, Okay, um, uh, but one of the problems with doing forcible updates is that uh, you could have an update and if WordPress hasn't really tested the update, it could break your site. So there is, there's, a, there's a tension here between getting the security patches in and then wrecking someone's site. And if, you're, if your business relies upon WordPress 
working and they push an update that crashes your site, that's a problem. Um, okay, so here's a, an interesting policy question. What about forcible updates from the government? And so this happened uh, uh, last year where there was a vulnerability and this, this Hafnian group from, from China was basically exploiting this vulnerability in, in Microsoft Exchange servers. And the basically they were popping up web shells that allowed uh, government hackers to be able to access anybody's Microsoft Exchange server that they were running. And so late uh, within a month or two, uh, the FBI uh, came forth. People had been noticing that uh, a white hat hacker had been automatically closing the vulnerability on their exchange servers. And as it turns out, uh, the FBI admitted that they were basically employing an active defense where they were finding the vulnerable exchange servers, going in there, removing the web shells that the adversary had placed on these exchange servers and then patching the exchange server. Now here's the question, because this uh, is gray area in terms of legality, right? Like, do we allow this to happen, this, this defend forward to happen? Because really these exchange servers are uh, an enterprises, right? And they're not expecting the government to be able to modify them. Uh, so this is a question uh, that people are posing as, uh, and so far, people aren't complaining about this, but this is this is a gray area in terms of what happens if the FBI tries to clean up and it crashes your your exchange server. Uh, that's that's an, uh, a policy issue. Um, another thing that has happened is bug bounties on popular packages. Uh, so it's not only remediating ones that are known. It's being able to find as many vulnerabilities in the open source software supply chain. And so we talked about OpenSSF that uh, Google is doing that tries to automate that. They're also paying people to find bugs in critical open source software packages. And so this is this bug bounties are very common in security. Uh, and so this is basically uh, their open source software vulnerability rewards program. And they basically put $10 billion <laughs> Uh, into this program to try and find those vulnerabilities that affect the most software out there. So, for example, if if you know if if, if there's a bug in Python or if there's a bug in in Node.js, like they need like because those things are used so prevalently, the leverage that you get, the benefit you get for fixing a bug in any of these systems that are used everywhere is so high. That's why they're putting a, a really high price tag on the bug bounties for this particular program. Okay, so that is vulnerable software. Um, the question that you might now ask is, what would an adversary do to attack software that is continuously kept up to date? So we have addressed the, the known vulnerable components by doing forced updates, by auto updating, by finding as many vulnerabilities as we can, releasing these CVEs, releasing the patches, getting things uh, up to date. And so the, the, the adversary is smart, the adversary is gonna adapt. And so the next thing I wanna talk about in terms of software components is supply chain attacks. Uh, so in this case, where known vulnerable co components, you wanna update immediately, if you are being attacked in the supply chain, then the strategy might not be to update immediately. Like if the adversary knows you're updating all the time, nightly, and can hijack the update, then they can get a backdoor into your application uh, within a day. And so uh, this is the flip side. And so intentionally the advice is opposite to each other because now, now you have, uh, out-of-date software that needs to be patched immediately, but the update process itself has to be secure. Otherwise, you don't want to patch immediately if you can't guarantee that. And that's that, that's why I'm covering these two separately. Um, and so when I'm talking about supply chain attacks, this is when you're updating, it might be perilous. And for supply chain attacks, I could do an entire course on just supply chain attacks. And this thing within the last two or three years has really taken off. Um, and so if you look in the DevSecOps uh, pipeline, this is sort of on the 
sort of folks focus more on the dev part of it. Um, you could have uh, vulnerabilities and malicious actors uh, inject themselves in any one of these steps where they're, as long as they can compromise any part of your dev chain, they can, they can basically subvert your application. There is an analysis that was done two years ago on all of the different supply chain attacks uh, that, well, 115 supply chain attacks. And they're looking at from the design, the implementation, to the testing, to the deployment, to the updates and the maintenance, they have seen attacks across the entire process. So throughout the DevSecOps uh, chain, uh, and then they they basically classified all of these different places where these supply chain attacks have occurred. Um, and this is the kind of um, this is sort of the the newer vector of vulnerabilities for a lot of these uh, software packages. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about the different parts of these attacks, uh, and then examples of where uh, where things can go wrong in your in your supply chain. Um, and so the first thing I want to talk about is compromising the distribution process itself, the update process. And so I mentioned earlier is that all of these products need to have a way of auto updating now. Um, and so if any of these update mechanisms go rogue, the adversary has a foothold on everybody's system that is using this update. And this is why it's gold, right? Like, like Windows Update. Windows Update is updating all the Windows machines uh, out there. If you find a vulnerability in Windows Update, or if you hijack the Windows Update infrastructure, you have a foothold on a whole bunch of machines. Uh, and the same thing with any of the Chrome, uh, Firefox, Dropbox, any of these update services that are running automatically in the background, now you have to protect those against getting hijacked. Um, so here's some examples. You can hijack the Windows Update client itself. So if you poison uh, or if you find a way of compromising a machine, what you can do is you can inject malicious code like these folks did uh, earlier in this year uh, to, to hijack the Windows Update client, which is this WUAU CLT. Uh, so this is the client. And so this particular, it, it's delivered as a malicious document, and then it injects code into the Windows Update client, and then it allows you to blend in as uh, a legitimate Windows uh, software to, to basically hijack the updates going through uh, this particular machine. Um, so that's one thing you can do. You can actually hijack the update servers themselves. So here's an example. Password State was a, or is a password manager, and it has an update mechanism for pushing out updates to its, its password vault software. Uh, adversaries hijacked the update server for password state and then injected uh, a backdoor that allowed them to reveal your the the user's passwords in the software that they were using. Um, and so that's uh, that's a problem. Another example of uh, hijacking an update server is uh, these things called mobile device managers. So if you go into an enterprise, one of the things that they do, is they have, because if you're bringing devices, mobile devices into an enterprise, they need a way to make sure that your mobile device is secure, like is up to date, has the latest in, in security patches. And so the mobile device manager gives you a way of saying, what is the blessed software image that every employee needs to be running on their phone? So, so let's say the company issues the phone and then wants to, to make sure that they're all kept to up to date in lockstep. And that's what these mobile device managers will do. They force the, the device to phone home and then to see whether or not it needs to be updated or not, and then we'll push the update if the phone needs it. And so one of the things that adversaries wanna do, they wanna hijack the mobile device manager server itself. And by doing so, you can issue a backdoor uh, sort of software image to all the mobile devices in an enterprise. And that's basically what this is. Uh, so they they basically found this Cerebrus uh, variant that was targeting an enterprise and was basically attempting to directly compromise the device from the server update 
from the MDM update process itself. Okay, so that's um, that's pretty scary, actually. Um, here's another one that uh, uh, that you might know about. So, not Petya was a piece of malware that Russia delivered to Ukrainians, and as it turns out, they couldn't just localize it to Ukrainians. So, not Petya got basically distributed across the whole uh, world. And it, it was basically, this was the most expensive piece of malware in terms of damage that it did uh, that we've ever recorded. So this got loose across the, the world. As it turns out, the initial infection vector for NotPetya was a forced update to a piece of financial software that the Russians had compromised. So they compromised the financial software company and then the server that that company was using to distribute updates into their financial software packages. And so they uh, basically were trying to target Ukrainian customers, but because they wrote this malware in a way that allowed it to spread beyond the initial vector, basically that vulnerability spread throughout the world. Uh, and so this is, this is an example of, of delivering malware via the update mechanism. And what's really interesting about NotPetya is that you were, you were vulnerable to not pet ya if you kept on updating. It turns out this is derived from pet ya, and pet ya was possible because you didn't update. So with pet ya, if you had the original vulnerability, this Win Windows Samba vulnerability, the fact that you had this is because you didn't do your updates properly. And so this is this is an interesting tension. Two two pieces of malware that are using the same vulnerability and the strategy for dealing with these two pieces of malware are opposite. One, you do want to do the update. The other, you don't want to do the update. And this is this is why I'm using this particular uh, example. OK, um, another way you can uh, attack the supply chain is to hijack the signing keys. Uh, so if you're doing an update, one of the things that all of these update mechanisms do is they force you to sign your update so that the client can say, oh, I know the public key of the legitimate software publisher. If it doesn't have a valid signature, I'm not going to run it. And so we, this is what we talked about a couple classes ago. So if you're an adversary, your target is to compromise the signing keys, right? Because if you have the signing keys of something that allows you to sign stuff to make it look legitimate, then no one's going to think twice about running that piece of software. And so here's an example from 2019 where they basically hijacked these ACES software updates uh, and they hijacked the signing key for this for ACES in order to deliver this, this uh, backdoor to basically a half a million machines. Um, and so this is basically the problem when you when you have compromised the signing key, then that malicious file looks legitimate. It's got the signature of the ACES uh, keys, and then people will install that. And systems won't prompt you because it's like, oh, that looks like a legitimate key, that, that, that a legit, legitimate signature. Here's another one. Uh, Infinity Games had their signing key stolen. And now uh, adversaries are able to uh, issue installers using the Infinity Games compromised signing key. Uh, and this is basically how um, uh, this particular malware was delivered. Um, okay. Uh, and I like this part of this article. It says certified fraud. Where <laughs> they're like, yeah, uh, I can make this fraud look legitimate because the signing keys are basically my stamp of approval. Um, for this update process. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is malicious developers. So uh, so the, the previous thing, we're talking about the update process. Uh, what happens if I have, if I have, if I'm a developer with malicious intent and I go into all of these projects that people are using to try and inject backdoors? Uh, and this is this is something that uh, uh, is kind of scary. So one of the things that's happening is people are writing and publishing all sorts of rogue software that looks legitimate. And so here's an example where uh, browser extensions that you add to your to your Chrome, for example, there's a whole bunch of these uh, extensions that are using legitimate code to 
provide some functionality and then inserting some vulnerable things in there so that when people install the extension, they're getting some functionality, but underneath they're getting stuff stolen from them. Uh, so they uh, they basically did an audit of these browser extensions, and it looks there's a, a massive number of these things that are slurping uh, user data. Um, here's another example where uh, open source software uh, and software that's used heavily, like Putty and Type VNC, people can take that code base, repackage it with a backdoor in them, and then get these things installed by um, because, you know, everybody needs, well, a lot of people need this functionality. And so if you, as long as the software package delivers that functionality, they won't think that they've been backdoored. Uh, so this is a hard problem. Um, a recent example of this uh, is onion poison. So next class, I'm going to talk about Tor. And so one of the things with Tor is that it allows you to bypass censorship. And so the Chinese government wants to control the the content going to and from China. And so in order to out the people using Tor, they distributed a backdoored version of Tor to try and reveal this information. And that's basically what this onion poison uh, software thing was, was they were basically modifying. And so Tor, the, the code base is there, you can download it. And so they repack, they basically took this browser and they added some small pieces of code to ship out the IP addresses of the people using this particular software. So again, this is something that gets a lot of people because uh, people aren't actually, oh, people who aren't aware will install this thinking that, oh yeah, I'm getting Tor and they will get Tor. They'll just get some other stuff as well. Um, uh, another interesting thing is publishing rogue containers. So we talked about containers that when they're published already are out of date and have vulnerabilities. The other thing that developers can do is create rogue versions themselves. And so you take a container that's got a legitimate purpose and then you tweak it to add a backdoor and then you put it on Docker Hub. And so one of the things that they did uh, just this month, actually, this is actually from last, this is from like six days ago. <laughs> and they did a scan of a quarter million container images on Docker Hub. And they were like, hey, there's actually almost a couple thousand of these containers that are malicious. And then they analyzed, well, what do these malicious containers do? And you see like, you know, in crypto mining, uh, scanning for secrets, um, all of these other different kinds of uh, uh, sort of functions that you would have these containers do. Um, probably the most pernicious thing is rogue packages themselves. Uh, and so we talked about earlier, this software, the, the, the iceberg of the packages that we're importing into our application. So we have PyPy and we have uh, NPM. These are the repositories that host the massive amount of library code that people are importing into their applications. So the idea for adversaries is, can I poison the packages in these repositories? And as it turns out, anybody can create a package and publish it in any of these repositories. Uh, so there's no vetting of code. This is not like your, your app stores for your phone. So when you try and publish an app on, on a phone, either Google or Apple are gonna look at that code and try and make sure it's not malicious. When you're talking about Python packages and JavaScript packages, there is no explicit vetting process. There isn't a company there that says, this software should be allowed and this software should not. It's basically like the Wild West. And so if you look at, well, these days, if you look at these repositories, you'll see a whole bunch of malicious packages in there. Uh, and so this is, this is basically how adversaries are trying to get code execution on anybody who installs those packages in their applications. And so it's basically now a malware platform. Um, there was an article that I really liked. Uh, this is from like 2017. It was like, just for fun, this person uh, implemented a, a, um, a package, a useful package, where it just was written to steal credit card numbers 
numbers and passwords. And so the, the, the notion was is because people are doing an NPM install or a PIP install of anything that they come across, <laughs> that he would be able to get a whole bunch of credit card numbers and passwords just by publishing this package. And this was just a toy example of this, but uh, this has actually been weaponized over the last several years. So here's an example. Uh, multiple backdoored Python libraries caught stealing AWS secrets and keys. And so what they'll do is they'll find a package that has some kind of useful function. So, uh, you know, maybe it's, maybe they'll get a package that, uh, has a similar name and then just pick, pick, pick the, uh, the code from those, from those, uh, particular, uh, repositories. And then what they'll do is they'll go into these packages and then they'll add several lines of code that will do something like this. So in this case, it'll go through your environment and will uh, we'll basically upload your, your current environment variables to this endpoint, this pygrata.com endpoint. Uh, and then the adversary that owns these domains will basically see your, your environment variables. And one of the things that I teach people in the uh, cloud class is that, yeah, rather than putting your AWS keys in your source code, you would pass them in as environment variables. Well, here's a package that's going to explicitly look in the environment variables for your AWS keys so that they can get it. Uh, and, you know, you need those keys somewhere in memory in order for this application to, uh, to, to hit, a, like, if this is, if you're using this package as part of your, sort of your application that you're running on AWS, then it would basically have that in their in its environment variables, the AWS keys, and so that's the idea of the of these particular packages. Um, so yeah, so say you need logging in your application, and you're using this package, and you're running this on AWS, and your your application has the AWS keys and the environment variables, then this thing will basically emit your AWS keys to the adversary. Here's one of my, uh, a funnier example, rogue favorite icons. And so if you know those fave icons, there's those little, little, little icons that show up in the browser tabs. Uh, so for example, like Zoom's got their little icon. And when you open up a tab in Zoom, it's got the little Zoom icon on there. And so a lot of people are like, oh, I don't wanna, I'm not an artist. I wanna use some other icons. There's libraries of fave icons. And so one of the things that uh, these hackers did was they basically created a icon archive portal and then we're like hey include our our fave icons and for the most part they're basically doing the legitimate thing giving them an icon but then every once in a while they'll include a malicious javascript file along with the fave icon that would run in the context of the browser tab to basically try and steal credit card and user information off of the page that the fave icon was included in and because you, as a developer, explicitly included that fave icon into your page, you explicitly allowed the scripts from that domain to run in the context of your, your domain. Uh, so that's basically what this particular thing is doing. Uh, the next class of, of uh, techniques that I'm gonna talk about are compromising the developers themselves or the developer accounts. So if you were if if you are a trusted developer and you're contributing a lot of code and your credentials are hijacked by an adversary, then you have control over the supply chain, uh, and so that's what this uh, uh, this this particular section is about. Uh, one of the examples that uh, shows this is this Webmin administration tool, and so this is a a web-based Linux administration tool that ran as basically um, a script, a Perl script on the backend server. And as it turns out, an adversary got into the Webmin development server, the build server. And so this is the server that's being used to, uh, to basically construct and ship the tool to the people that are using it. So an adversary got into that supply chain and then uh, added a password change script or a vulnerability to the password change script and then uh, is, this was running for about a year, and then the adversary was able to uh, basically get a backdoor into a whole bunch of uh, Webmin servers. Here's another example from earlier this year. This was PHP uh, pass. There's a password hashing library for PHP. Um, and as it turns out, the, the, 
the original author for this package basically abandoned his GitHub account. And so you can you can either abandon or delete your GitHub. And so the adversary was like, oh, well, if I reclaim that that account name, I can basically hijack the reputation of that developer. And so that's basically what was done here. And as uh, what they did was they took this uh, uh, this software and they added these three lines of code to the code base. And if you look, it's like it's looking for the access the AWS uh, credentials of a project, and then uh, it's basically going to upload this stuff. Um, well, later on, I guess there's more there's more than just three editions, but it basically will actually no. This is how the exfiltration happens. It gets this URL with the access key and the secret as part of the URL. And then the adversary who owns this domain is going to look through the log files and then see the AWS key and the um, the access key, the secret key and the access key together as part of the exfiltration. So yeah, just these three lines of code um, basically get some, like if you've deployed this this hashing library in your web app and it's actually housed in AWS, then you can get the credentials from the project. Okay, and so when they did a post-mortem, they were like, how did this person, Hotlook, do this? Because Hotlook was a trusted developer, was the author of this. And as it turns out, this particular Hotlook was revived. So after this developer deleted the account, then uh, this got revived. And if you looked at this account, it was only nine days old, but the actual commits in GitHub go all the way back uh, throughout time when that was actually a legitimate GitHub account. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, attack. This happened from last year. This is the UA parser JavaScript NPM library. This thing gets millions of downloads a week and it's used in a whole bunch of organizations. And it was hijacked to install a bunch of password stealers and miners. And so what happened was the adversary was able to hijack the developer's NPM account. And then as soon as you get the account credentials, you can push versions of this package up as the original developer. And this is the reason why over the last year or two, um, uh, NPM and, and PyPy has started shipping multi or has started forcing developers who contribute packages to have two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication for anyone who is uh, pushing pack popular packages up into these repositories just because of something like this happening. They don't want those developer accounts to get compromised easily so that they can be used to weaponize the shipment of malicious software, uh, like in this case. And so what happened was the adversary basically got this developer account, and then in this library, uh, added uh, basically this code to it, where they're basically getting the passwords uh, out of the password vault and then storing it into a file that would then exfiltrate the password somewhere else. So that's what this this two lines of code will do. And then the other part that got added to this package was to run a crypto miner. And so in this case, you're running a uh, you're running a miner and getting you know pointing it to a pool. Uh, a mining pool in order to get money to sent to this particular wallet address uh, that you see here. So you're basically stealing CPU cycles. And actually, like when you are looking at malware and you see something like this, you are like, oh, phew, it's just a crypto miner <laughs> because the adversary can do way more damage than just running a crypto miner. This is really evident that like this is a high noise uh, event when they run a crypto miner. And so if they've done this, you're actually, you you may have dodged a bullet. Uh, here's another one from a little further back, SSH Decorate. And so the adversary steals this person's PyPy account, this developer's PyPy account, and then backdoors this uh, decoration, SSH decoration uh, package and basically adds code to steal the SSH key. And so this is the code that got added uh, to this package. And basically it just reads the private key file and then invokes this log uh, function. And the log function will basically open up this URL and then post the data um, that it pulls from the private key file. And now you have the SSH key of, of whoever is doing this, whoever has included this. And then you can use that SSH key to get into wherever this has been enabled uh, by the by the user. Here's another interesting one, PHP's Git server. 
And this is, these are the greatest hits. These are things that are being used by a lot of people, but this is happening all over. This is more than just the, the cases that I'm showing you. Uh, with PHP, PHP is used in a lot of places. And so this particular compromise, they compromised the backend Git server that the PHP developers were using in their code base. And so if you can get into the source repository of the package maintainers for PHP, you can do something that looks like this. And in this case, they look, they basically are looking for a user agent that is very specific. And if they find this user agent as part of their, um, as part of the, so a specially crafted web request that has a user agent that's set to a very specific string, will invoke this eval down here. Will allow you to just uh, basically evaluate a, a payload that's sent by the user. So this is immediate remote code execution for anyone who has updated their PHP to use what was in the development server. Now this got caught before they shipped a version that had this backdoor, but this is very sneaky, right? Like to, to basically get into the infrastructure of the software developers maintaining the package for something that everyone is using. Um, so this uh, this didn't this didn't actually create a vulnerability, but it could have. Um, uh, the most famous one recently is the solar winds uh, vulnerability. So the idea the, the the what happened here is that someone compromised a developer account uh, for this security vendor. So solar winds makes a security product. And uh, one of the developers had basically they used credential stuffing or they they compromised the credentials of the developer for solar winds and they went in there and they they constructed a very sneaky backdoor and then because that wasn't caught in the development process they shipped this vulnerable solar wind software to a whole bunch of customers now solar winds is a security product and you're relying on running a security product to make yourself more secure this is the case where you you are less secure by running this security product uh, and this cost a hundred billion dollars to remediate. Um, okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about are insider attacks, um, similar to malicious developers, but you're you're using insiders not to inject code, but uh, to get other kinds of uh, uh, nefarious act uh, actions done. So some examples of this: uh, AT and T in 2019, uh, they had uncovered a whole. Uh, operation for bribing store workers and employees uh, in order to get them to install malware uh, in the in their offices. Uh, so this is something that um, is, you know, as an organization, you might not be expecting your employees to get bribed to install malicious software, but it does happen. So then you have to think about, well, what do I have any controls? Like, uh, does Portland State have any controls if I like if someone paid me a million dollars to take a USB stick and plug it into a machine on campus. Would I would I take that million dollars? You're like, well, that's a million dollars. Um, so this happened to Tesla. So Tesla it was like an employee thwarted a potential ransomware plot. So it wasn't a million. This was a half a million dollars. They were like, this person was offered half a million dollars to basically install malware on a machine on the corporate network. And so this is a, actually a relatively cheap way of getting access to an organization. It's like, yeah, half a million dollars. That actually might uh, uh, save you. I'm, well, I don't know if that's cheap, um, but that is actually kind of expensive. But maybe if you, maybe if someone would do it for 50, uh, that would be cheaper. Um, uh, this, uh, so over, over the fall, actually three or four months ago, um, the former CISO of Twitter was giving congressional testimony and this particular snippet came out uh, uh, where Twitter, so nation states are trying to infiltrate Twitter because a lot of dissidents are posting on Twitter. And if you have someone on the inside of Twitter uh, who can pull out information that the government wants, then they, that's, that's an excellent attack vector. And so the Saudi Arabia has done this where they turned a Twitter engineer into an informant and then that engineer was able to get information on people posting through twitter that the saudi government wanted to monitor so in a similar way the fbi notified twitter that uh, a chinese agent was in the company and one of the things that uh, the ciso 
uh, recalled in an exchange was that uh, the Twitter uh, employee's response was like, we already have one, so what does it matter if we have more? And that's the, that's the problem with um, trusting your employees to do the right thing necessarily. If it's not high priority on their list, then you have this issue where you're, you can't trust the people in your organizations to, to, to be able to secure your, your service. But, so this is the adversary doing it. Uh, one of the things that the Department of Justice is doing is trying to turn the tables, right? And this is what this Rewards for Justice program is doing. And so they're basically paying people uh, for tips on cyber criminal activity. And so if you can, uh, and this is $10 million, right? If you use the federal government to infiltrate uh, ransomware gangs, for example, or uh, any of these APT crews that are causing all this damage, then you can basically leverage an insider uh, 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 to provide you information. Okay, that's insider attacks. The next thing I wanna talk about are abandoned packages. And so if you're using software that uh, uh, basically hasn't been updated in a long time, uh, you can have some issues. Here's, uh, here's an XKCD that I like where you, you take a picture of all, all this is this is very related to Google's uh, open SSF program. You like you look at all of this infrastructure that Google relies upon. And then somewhere over here, there is some random person thanklessly maintaining a tiny piece of code that you rely upon. Uh, and it's holding the whole thing up. Um, and that's basically what we have. Um, and this is a problem. This is I'm just going to show you a picture of Kubernetes dependency tree. So lots of organizations are using Kubernetes to manage their, their compute infrastructure. This is just a snapshot of all of the packages and software packages and dependency that Kubernetes has. And this is immense, right? Uh, and so you know, people are thanklessly maintaining a whole bunch of this code that is basically running modern infrastructure. So that's a, that's a picture of it. So I'll give you some examples. So CTX this is a, pop, a popular package for uh, storing local state for, for Python programs. And the maintainer, the DNS name that was used to host this package and the, the, the maintainer's sort of site uh, expired. And so the person who registered it, who originally uh, created this package, didn't renew that DNS name. And then the adversary was able to, re to register the name and claim the package for him or herself. And so by doing so, because PyPy is doing these, uh, uh, you're basically registering accounts using your, your email address at a particular domain, because you hijacked that DNS name, you now have controlled that particular package. So it wasn't necessarily abandoned as it, the DNS name uh, lapsed. And then as part of this, the adversary, because they got ownership of this abandoned package, uh, package was able to add this particular commit. Uh, and this, this release basically added the same kind of stuff we've seen before. Get the environment variable to get the access key ID and get the secret access key, and then basically send it to this endpoint. Uh, so again, this similar similar vulnerability that we have seen before. Here's another one. It was event stream in 2018. You know, a million weekly downloads of this thing uh, included in thousands of uh, other packages. And what happened here was that the the adversary uh, basically tried to be a maintainer for event stream and uh, was working with the original maintainer and adding code to the package in order to gain the maintainer's trust. And the maintainer didn't want to maintain this software anymore. Uh, they wanted to abandon it. And so rather than abandoning it, they basically assigned the ownership of the package over to the malicious developer. Uh, and so that, as soon as the, the, the transfer was done, then this is where the malicious uh, developer basically added a dependency uh, to steal Bitcoin wallets using this uh, event stream package. And then this particular soft, the particular code that they added which just emits the wallet address to a, an IP address, a well-known IP address. Okay, um, so those are uh, abandoned packages. The next class of uh, vulnerabilities I want to talk about are typo squats. 
Uh, and we talked a little bit about typo squatting, but I want to give you some more examples of this. Um, so here's an example of pi Mafka, and this is a typo squat of pi Kafka. So this is a very common tool that's used. It's a Python. It's a it's a Kafka client for Python. So Kafka is basically a sort of a event notification log stream that are, is used in the cloud. And so you can think of it as a sort of a queuing mechanism for the cloud. And so you're you're able to add insert events into this log stream uh, that Kafka holds. And so uh, what this particular adversary did was they basically created a a some a lookalike called Pi Mafka. Uh, they took all the code from Pi Kafka, and then they created this new package. And then what this new package did is did everything that Pi Kafka did, but then it added this code here. And what this code does is it basically retrieves a binary from this this IP address 141.164.58.147, and this is this win.exe binary. And as it turns out, this is a Cobalt Strike program, and this Cobalt Strike program is basically an offensive uh, security. Uh, it's basically an implant. When you compromise a machine, you'll often download a Cobalt Strike client so that you can basically weaponize that machine for you know running a botnet or stealing credentials. It, it has all that code built in, and so basically, as part of this package, it downloads the Cobalt Strike client. Uh, and then it tries to run it as Internet Explorer. So it, it basically, uh, it downloads it as win.exe and then opens up a Internet Explorer.exe and then it just runs that thing. Uh, so that's that's the, um, and then what it does is it opens the environment. It basically gives you a shell uh, on this thing if you're on Linux. And if it's on Windows, it basically runs um, the Cobalt Strike client. Uh, so that's that's an interesting typo squat. And so most developers, if you um, if you import this one instead of Pi Kafka, you'll just get you get same functionality but slightly uh, a malicious uh, result. Uh, here's another one, colors dash 2.0, and this typo squats this colors package for color highlighting. So why wouldn't you install colors 2.0? instead of colors, because this looks like the more up-to-date version, right? So this is quite clever. Um, and this basically is stealing a whole bunch of Discord tokens and establishing reverse shells. And not only that, the adversary, the person who's who's de developing this, has also uploaded these, these packages, right? And so all of these things look legitimate. Uh, so colors 3.0, uh, uh, but they actually all have this malicious code installed as well. And so this is where, as a developer, all of you are in the CS program, you have to really understand, well, which package is the legitimate one out of all of these things? And this is where you would start looking at the number of downloads that uh, NPM or PyPy has for this particular package. And that should be at least some barometer as to the legitimacy of a particular package uh, that you download. Here are some other ones. So this is, these are uh, Django uh, typo squats. So Django, uh, Django, um, all of these things are typo squatted from uh, packages that are super popular. And then they're basically taking all of the code and then just injecting a couple of lines of code in things like the setup.py. So when you do a pip install of any package, it will automatically run this setup Python script. So if you've uploaded a package that has a malicious couple of lines in setup.py, this is how you can get code execution uh, on anyone who's done a pip install of your typo squatted uh, package. Um, okay, so here are some other ones, date util versus Python 3 date util. Uh, so which one was which one of these two is legitimate? Um, I actually I think it's date util is the legitimate one, but that one looks pretty legitimate. Um, here's another one. If you're copying and pasting pip install instructions, so for example, for my code labs, like you're, if you just copy and paste those things saying, oh, this is a pip install, um, here's, here's two packages, uh, jellyfish versus jellyfish. Which one would you want to install? They look identical, um, but as it turns out, these two things are different. And so if you have a website that says, oh, um, this is how I got an application to run, I pip installed jellyfish, and somebody has typo squatted things in a way that uses a font 
where these two things look the same. As it turns out, let me do this in place on the slide. Um, if I turn this from a particular font into courier, you can see exactly what the difference is between these two uh, versions of software. Let me... Uh, Let me find this so I can do this. Uh, this is how sneaky it is because you know this will get you. Like I've copy and pasted pip install instructions before. Um, so what I'll do is I'll I'll change this into a courier font uh, in place. And then you can see the difference. Uh, so jellyfish, the one on the left is the legitimate one. But the one on the right has a capital I instead of a lowercase L. And because you've used a particular font, so let me undo this, the capital I and the little L look identical in this particular font. And this is how you would get the, the thing installed, the malicious package installed instead of the legitimate one. So this is just food for thought. Uh, and then this particular library basically you know, looks to steal your SSH keys. Uh, in this case. Uh, here's another one. So Python requests is the legitimate pro uh, package for doing HTTP requests using Python. This is the one that we use in the Web and Cloud Security class prevalently. Uh, there is a typo squat where you could you leave off the S. And then in this case, this, is the, this was the malicious package. And so this uh, a particular package that used requests. So this is a legitimate package. And the, the developer mistakenly left off the S. And by importing the the uh, the rogue one, it got the it got the functionality of Python requests, but it also got a password stealer uh, shipped into this uh, into this uh, distribution as well. So here are some common targets for typo squats. Uh, and you can see, you know, crypt, Django, uh, NumPy, uh, for those who are doing like machine learning kinds of stuff, matplotlib for data science folks, uh, OpenCV uh, for visual computing, Pandas for data science, PySpark for machine learning. They all have these typo squats so that if you include these things, uh, this, this one's really sneaky, URL lib. Uh, if you leave out one of the Ls, this is a malicious package. Um, these are all malicious uh, uh, attacks, basically, uh, on on packages uh, that are that are legitimate. Okay, so the last thing uh, I'm going to cover is package dependency confusion, and this is quite a recent uh, development. So this got PayPal, Apple, Microsoft, and a whole bunch of other companies, uh, and so this is a cartoon. Uh, that uh, that shows the problem. Uh, so one of the things that happens when you are developing in any of these uh, modern programming languages is that, yeah, you will have a lot of code that you write yourself that you want to create internal packages for. And then there will be code that you have, you know, you rely on external packages for. And so if you have a package that you have created internally called awesome lib, and then all of a sudden, someone registers an external package named awesome lib. Which version do you install? Uh, and that's basically dependency confusion because you you can only you, you choose one, and if you choose the wrong one, then you have issues. And so there are cases where people prefer using the external one over the internal one. And then there are cases where you actually want the internal one only and not anything external. And that's dependency confusion and package confusion. So in this case, uh, someone saw that this is an internal PayPal uh, package manifest. So this is uh, for Node.js applications, for JavaScript applications. All of your package dependencies are kept in this package.json file. And so they've highlighted here the package dependencies that are external, and those are in blue. But then PayPal has implemented some internal packages. And then when they do an NPM install, 
they'll retrieve the external ones from NPM, the repository, but then they'll want to retrieve the internal JavaScript packages from their own internal repository, uh, JavaScript repositories. And so the question that this person, this researcher asked was, what happens if somebody on NPM registers packages with the exact same names as these internal ones? And as it turns out, you get code execution. This is how they got on the inside of all of these organizations, because in a lot of cases, the preference is to go and install the external version of the package if it's available. And if it can't find it in the external repository, then use the internal ones. And so you can see the problem here, right? Because if somebody just randomly creates this package, now uh, PayPal is going to install this rather than being an internal one, being an external version. Okay, so this thing is now being used. If you look at all the malicious the pa packages being uploaded into these repositories now, people are trying to target this. So uh, they're like Amazon, uh, Zillow, Slack, Lyft. Uh, uh, all of these uh, things are being targeted for package names to, to try and trick these companies into running the software in the in the rogue version of the of the packages. And so uh, this is a, an article from last year where uh, as soon as this vulnerability was uh, was released or this this mechanism was released, everybody was trying to to take advantage of it. So you see this flood of malicious libraries being uploaded into these repositories. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some prevention uh, and this is hard to prevent. Um, and so the statistics of software supply chain attacks, uh, this is just, this is a recent graph, and this is why I'm covering this aspect of this, because I think this is actually going to be the biggest delta for me to cover in the application security. You see that this is now being something that's targeted all the time. Uh, so this is a cumulative statistic on dependency confusion, typo squatting, and malicious code injection into package repositories. Uh, this is where the battleground uh, for application developers is being fought. Uh, and so what are some prevention uh, techniques? Well, one of the things is to reduce the attack surface. So if you are relying on unnecessary components, you got to get rid of them, um, is uh, the idea. Another thing that people do is freeze your package versions. And so this is the exact opposite of what you would do for vulnerable components. You're like, you know what? I don't want anybody to be able to change a package I rely upon underneath me. Sorry. That's me. Oh, it stopped. <laughs> That's my phone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, another thing to do is signed code and behavior manifest. So the developer has to intentionally sign a package. And then you have um, the idea is that you would just use this is so sort of uh, digital signatures in order to get authenticity of your software. And so you would have your developer uh um, basically sign you would trust certain developer keys and then you would only import packages from uh from software that has an appropriate signature that you have accepted and then the idea is that not only do they have to hijack the account they also have to hijack a signing key in order for you to import that software into your your repository so uh they're talking about having for any of these developers of packages that are used heavily uh they are forcing you not only can do you have to commit something but you have to sign your commit uh using some kind of token or security key so that just hijacking the account doesn't allow the adversary full-on access um to this uh, and so this is one of the things that Kubernetes is adopting. And so we saw that graph of the supply chain for Kubernetes. Uh, they're adopting this SigStore solution uh, to basically uh, try and nail down their supply chain so that a rogue developer can't, can't uh, compromise the entire thing. Um, and then the next thing, this is where the software bill of materials uh, and validating all of the things within it uh, is being done to try and make sure that everything in there is legitimate. Okay, so with